Hi, welcome to Chemical Reactions Review Part 3. My name is Dr. English, and today we're going to focus on what drives a chemical reaction. So specifically, again, what drives a chemical reaction to completion, looking at double replacement reactions one more time, how can you determine if two ionic compounds will react, and finally some examples using table F of your reference tables. So what drives a chemical reaction? What makes chemical reaction actually take place? you need to be aware that there are three different types of situations that can cause a chemical reaction to occur. The first is if a precipitate, otherwise known as a solid, is formed as a product. So if we look at this example right here, we have lead 2 nitrate reacting with potassium iodide to form lead 2 iodide and potassium nitrate. What we look at here to see if a solid is formed is the little phases at the bottom. The lead 2 nitrate and the potassium iodide are both aqueous solutions. We're assuming that if it's a double replacement reaction occurring with ionic compounds, that we're dealing with two different solutions being combined together. So our solvent in these situations is water, and we know that, again, because of the little aq. So when we combine these two solutions together, both which are soluble, soluble solutes in our solvent of water, we're going to form lead to iodide and potassium nitrate. Now, by looking at the little subscripted phases here, I see that lead to iodide is a solid. The formation of that particular compound is going to drive the reaction forward. The other product here, potassium nitrate, is not a solid. It's an aqueous solution, so that means it's going to form ions in the solvent of water. This reaction will definitely occur because we're forming this solid right here. Another way that a reaction can occur is if one of the products formed is a gas. So here I have nitric acid as my solution. I'm adding calcium metal to it. And as a result of this reaction, which is really exothermic, uh, you're going to produce hydrogen gas. So there's my gas. And then calcium nitrate. So the calcium nitrate is going to be formed really as ions, but we're not looking at net ionic equations here. We're just looking at general chemical equations. The products that are formed are hydrogen gas and calcium nitrate. The hydrogen gas is what's driving this reaction forward, okay, because if it's, especially if it's an open system where the gas can just be released out into the environment, that's going to push the reaction forward. The final example would be if a molecular substance such as water is formed. So here we have an acid-base reaction. So we have hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide is always going to produce salt and water. Here's our molecular substance of water, and then our sodium chloride, again, which is soluble because we can see it as aqueous right here. So that will also drive a reaction forward. To summarize one more time, there are three situations that can drive a reaction to completion. One, the formation of a solid. Two, the formation of a gas. Or three, the formation of a molecular substance. So let's look at double replacement reactions one more time, just in general, because really we already reviewed this. In a double replacement reaction, the positive ions from the two reactant ionic compounds are going to switch places with each other to form new ionic compounds. We look for reactions that have two compounds as reactants and two ionic compounds as products. Symbolically, we can represent this as A and B plus C and D. When we look at ionic compounds in general, we have the positive ion first, the negative ion second, the positive ion first, the negative ion second. So I'm keeping B and D in the same spot, but what I am doing is I'm reversing the location of the A and the C. A, instead of being with B, A is now going to be with D. Okay, so it's going to switch partners. And C, instead of being with D, is now going with B. So C is going to hook up with B. It's still the positive ion first and the negative ion second. Positive, negative. So all I've done is taken the two positive ions and just switched places. And the key thing here, again, is that when you're doing a double replacement reaction, you always want to make sure that you write the correct formulas for your products. So here's an example down here. We have barium chloride reacting with magnesium sulfate. The barium, which is my positive ion, and the magnesium, which is my positive ion, are just going to switch spots. So now the barium, instead of being with the chloride ion, is now going to be with the sulfate ion, and I can see that over here. 
the magnesium, instead of being with the sulfate ion, is now going to be with the chlorine ion. So again, we see that right here. The important thing again, though, is to remember, when you're making these new products, you have to write the correct formulas because then we could go back and balance it and make sure that the reaction has gone to completion. So how can you determine if two ionic compounds are going to react? You have to ask yourself the question, will an insoluble compound, otherwise known as a solid or a precipitate, be formed? So let's look over two definitions really quick before we start going into table F. One is soluble. If a compound is soluble, that means it's going to dissolve into water. In other words, it's going to break down into positive and negative ions. And really what's going to happen here is we're going to have an ion molecule force of attraction between the dissolved ions and the water molecules. We'll make a little note to ourselves. We're going to have an ion molecule force of attraction. Force of attraction which is a type of intermolecular force that we'll talk about later on in review. If the compound is deemed insoluble, it means it's not going to dissolve in water to any appreciable degree. Now in regions chemistry, when we look at soluble versus insoluble, it's really one or the other. Either it's classified as soluble and being able to dissolve, or insoluble and not being able to dissolve. Realistically, all compounds in water will dissolve to some degree. It might be to a very small degree. And if your teacher has taught you about KSP and you're in an honors chemistry course, absolutely fine. But when it comes to the exam, really they're going to fall into one of two categories, soluble or insoluble. So an insoluble compound, again, is a compound that does not dissolve in water to any appreciable degree and will remain intact when added to water. All right, determining solubility using table F. Table F is very important to understand how to use. So table F is going to show the solubilities of different compounds, in other words, which are soluble and which are insoluble. On the exam, if they ask you a solubility question, they are limited to just using the ions that are on this chart. They can't deviate when they write a question. They can't deviate beyond it unless they give you more information. So these are our solubility guidelines. Remember, this is for aqueous solutions, which means that our solvent here is water. Water. So in this first column right here, we have ions that form soluble compounds. So we make a note to ourselves. Will dissolve in water. Will dissolve in water. If your compound has anything from group 1, contains ammonium, nitrate, the acetate, either in the inorganic or the organic version, hydrogen carbonate, chlorate, the halides, or sulfate, it will be soluble in water. Now, of course, we have exceptions to the rules. These will form soluble compounds, unless these particular ions are involved in the compounds. Now, for some of these, there's no exceptions, which means things like nitrate always will be soluble. In general, the halides are soluble unless they're combined with silver, lead, or mercury. Same thing with the sulfates. Sulfates are typically soluble unless they're combined with silver, calcium, strontium, barium, or lead. So over in this block, these are soluble ions unless they fall under the exceptions. Over on this block, we have ions that form insoluble compounds. So when we mean by insoluble, these are will not dissolve in water, will not dissolve in water. So carbonate, chromate, phosphate, sulfide, hydroxide, any of these ions, insoluble, will not dissolve to any appreciable degree, unless they're with one of the exceptions. And the exceptions here tend to repeat themselves. Carbonate, insoluble, unless it's with a group 1 ion or ammonium, which makes sense. Because if we go back to this block over here, any time a group 1 ion is in a compound, it's soluble. Basically, it's just confirming this block over here. Same thing with chromate. If it's combined with a group 1 ion, calcium, magnesium, or ammonium, it is soluble. So under normal circumstances, insoluble will just stay as a solid unless it's combined with one of these ions. Phosphate, same thing as carbonate. Group 1 ions or ammonium, uh, same thing with sulfide. It'll be insoluble, it'll stay as a solid 
again, unless it's with a group one ion or ammonium. And finally, hydroxide, typically going to be insoluble unless it's with a group one ion, specifically calcium, barium, strontium, or ammonium. Any of the combination of these ions with hydroxide will be soluble. And you should know this based on your understanding of acid-base chemistry. So let's round up this review by looking at some examples using Table F. When attempting to decide if a compound is soluble or insoluble, take the time to break the neutral ionic compounds up into their component ions. So let's look at sodium chloride first. So sodium chloride. My positive ion will be sodium, so that's Na. It only has one charge, which is plus, and the negative ion is chlorine, and I'm going to use the negative right here. So then I ask myself, is this soluble? So I go to table F, and I look at my solubility guidelines. Na is here, Cl is here. So Na is a group one metal which means that it is going to be soluble. So this would be a soluble compound. So again, when I look at this, soluble or insoluble in water, this is going to be soluble. Now let's go on to the next one, calcium sulfate. My positive ion here is Ca plus 2. Sulfate is SO4 minus 2, and I can look this up into my reference table to make sure that this is uh, the correct formulas and charges for each one of these ions. And now I go to table F and I ask myself the question, is this particular compound, calcium sulfate, soluble or insoluble? So here's table F. Calcium is in a whole bunch of different places, but sulfate is right here. Here's sulfate. Sulfate is typically a soluble compound unless it's combined with Ag, Ca, Sr, Ba, and Pb. And here's Ca. So that means the formula of calcium sulfate is going to be insoluble. So we'll go back to our example and we'll call that insoluble because it falls into an exception to the rule. So again, we have Ca plus 2, SO4 minus 2. This would be CaSO4 for our compound, and this would be classified as insoluble. Now let's look at our last example here. We have ammonium sulfide. So ammonium as a positive ion would be NH4 plus 1, and the sulfide is S minus 2. So when we make this formula, if we cross down, it would be NH4 parentheses 2 with the S right here. So now we're asking ourselves the question, is this soluble or insoluble? So again, we'll go to table F. Just like with calcium being sort of all over the table, so is the ammonium. Now, ammonium is over here. Ammonium. And ammonium, turns out, is always soluble. There are no exceptions to the rule with ammonium. Right from that fact right there, we could call it soluble. But if we wanted to double check ourselves, we could go over to the sulfide. Now, the sulfide is typically insoluble unless it's combined with a group 1 ion or ammonium. These two places right here basically confirm the fact that ammonium sulfide will be soluble in water. So to summarize one more time, based on the examples that we have here, sodium chloride is Na plus 1 and Cl minus 1. And if I look that up on table F, I'll notice that this is a group 1 metal, so it is soluble. Calcium sulfate, Ca plus 2, SO4 minus 2. Sulfates are typically soluble unless they're combined with things like calcium, so that would be insoluble. And finally, again, the last one, ammonium sulfide, NH4 plus 1, S minus 2. Anything with ammonium in it is typically going to be soluble. Therefore, this compound as a whole, if added to water, would be soluble. So what did we learn in this review? Well, we went over the three factors that drive a chemical reaction. We looked at double replacement reactions one more time. We looked at table F to determine if two ionic compounds will react. And then we looked at some examples. Need more help? Feel free to contact me, and I'm always looking for feedback. Have a great day.